Hi guys, welcome to this next screencast which is on the long term adaptations of the musculoskeletal system. So we've done the short term responses um, to exercise, now we're looking at the long term adaptations. So what happens after we do about a six to eight week training program? Now as part of your little introduction what you might want to do is talk about how adaptations take place um, after a six to eight week training program. And these happen because your body realises that exercise is harder than normal day-to-day -day activities. So it needs to make sure that it can cope with the increased demands. So what we're going to learn in this kind of screencast today is the adaptations that take place to the musculoskeletal system. So we're going to be talking about the bones, the muscles and the joints as well as um, the cartilage and um, our posture and so on. So first of all, underneath um, the heading for long-term benefits for bones, we have two main benefits, okay, and these are increased bone density and, in, and a decrease in the risk of osteoporosis. Now we're going to go through what osteoporosis is when we get to that part. First of all, if we're talking about increased um, bone density, so long-term exercise results in an increase in bone density. This benefits the body because it means our bones get stronger due to an increase in calcium content. So what happens is when we exercise, we actually stimulate an increase in calcium. So this calcium, what happens is we get more calcium to the bone and the bone just becomes more dense. And essentially from that it becomes stronger. Now the types of exercises that help with this are weight bearing exercises such as resistance machines in the gym, jogging, squatting, using a bench press in the gym. Now sporting activities that will have kind of like high bone density would be around the hips for a volleyball player okay so uh, hips for the footballer um, the spine for a volleyball player because if you think of the amount of um, jumping and bounding that um, volleyball players do that the spine the bone density of the spine for a volleyballer is really quite high now if you think of that compared to a cyclist the bone density um, of the spine for a cyclist is really low because they're doing no jumping bounding they're sitting down for their whole exercise routine and they're just working their legs aren't they so a cyclist has pretty much low bone density with regards to spine the hip arms and legs because they're not doing much in terms of um, bounding and these weight bearing exercises they're not holding any weight really now it's good having a high bone density is really good because it helps prevent the risk of injury doesn't it so if you fall over take a bad tackle in football you're less likely to cause a fracture due to the fact that your bone density is stronger it may reduce the risk of getting a stress fracture in a marathon runner and so on okay so that's bone density now osteoporosis first of all what is it essentially it's the weakening of the bones and it's caused by loss of calcium so if you're not exercising, if you think I've just said that when you exercise, you get an increase in calcium to the bones, which makes them stronger. Now this is the opposite. This is you don't get enough calcium to the bones. So if you do not exercise regularly, you are at risk of getting osteoporosis. It's also due to a lack of vitamin D as well. And osteoporosis kind of comes on with age and then bones lose their mineral density and become brittle, fragile and more likely to fracture. So osteoporosis is usually seen in the older population. However, you can still get osteoporosis as a young person. So, you get a decreased risk of osteoporosis with long-term exercise and you get that decreased risk because of this calcium. As we've just previously learned about bone densities, cal loads of calcium goes to the bone which makes it stronger. When we exercise, more calcium to the bone makes them stronger, decreases the risk of osteoporosis. And the types of exercises that are really good for this are weight bearing exercises again. So overloading the skeleton, this will increase the bone density. Now the University of Arizona has a useful, useful kind of acronym to remember this and it's called um, LIV. So you've got load so the load that you're putting on a weight bearing exercise is make a difference to your bones intensity so build stronger bones varies the various type of exercise you're doing and the routine that you're doing keep it interesting and then finally the e is enjoy so you've got to enjoy your exercise if you're not enjoying exercise you won't take part in exercise and therefore you're going to increase the risk of osteoporosis so when we're talking about the long-term adaptations of the musculoskeletal system specifically the benefits to bones 
we're talking about a high bone density and a decreased risk of osteoporosis. And this final little bit here is just talking about how vitamin D is used to regulate the amount of calcium in the body and is produced from sunlight. So getting sun is a good thing. Just make sure you're wearing sunscreen. So now we're going on to long-term benefits for the joints. So when we're talking about the joints, the benefits we are talking about are stronger connective tissues, increased cartilage, increased stability of joints, connective tissue is or are sorry tendons because tendons connect muscle to bone and ligaments because ligaments connect bone to bone so when we exercise we our tendon the ligaments become stronger this stronger connective tissue so first one connective tissue tendon tendons and ligaments are made up of connective tissue they connect things together muscles to bone and bone to bone so exercise increases the strength of both ligaments and tendons this increases the number of collagen fibers in connective tissue this means you're more resistant to injury. So, if we're talking about ligaments, so our ligaments become stronger with exercise. So when you start to train, your ligaments actually stretch each time you exercise. This makes them slightly more flexible. Now, the more flexible they get, the less risk they are of spraining, i.e. tearing apart, because they're more flexible, so they can withstand that kind of ankle roll a tiny bit more because they're a tiny bit more flexible. So with exercise, we reduce the risk of sprains because our ligaments become stronger. Similarly, um, we get stronger connections between muscles and bones due to increased tendon strength. So once again, tendons adapt to overload, i.e. kind of bounding, jumping, volleyball, football, resistance machines in the gym. This regular exercise their increase in flexibility and strength means that we're going to reduce the risk of getting a muscular strain. So that's a really good benefit, isn't it, when it comes to exercise, the fact that we're not going to get injured or we're less likely to get injured due to the fact that our ligaments and tendons are stronger. And then here's just some examples of some ligaments within the knee. So you've got here, I think that is the, if I'm looking at the angle correctly, you'll have that as the MCL, so medial collateral ligament. There you go, it says it there. LCL, lateral, outside, ligament. And then you've got your ACL and PCL in here. Now the ACL is one not the one that, look at this angle, this is one that the footballers um, tend to rupture quite often. That there completely goes, which basically means that your femur here can slide over your tibia, which is obviously makes it very unstable, which isn't ideal. And then here we have some tendons, so that's your quadricep muscle, and it inserts here just something called your patella, where well, you've got your patella ligament here, and it um, inserts here to your tibial tuberosity. You don't need to know that, but that's where it inserts down here. So it could be called your quadriceps tendon or your patella tendon, and then you've got your ligament here. So, cartilage, we should know about hyaline cartilage. Hyaline cartilage is um, in all synovial joints. Here's a little description of it here, and it's at the end of the bones to help shock absorb and also um, make movement more easy or easier. So, hyaline cartilage absorbs synovial fluid during exercise. Over time, by absorbing nutrients from the synovial fluid, your cartilage becomes thicker and is more able to protect your joints better. Now, you think we don't exercise much, don't get any synovial fluid into the joint. We get minimal synovial fluid into the joint capsule. This means the cartilage isn't getting nourished. It starts to wear away. When we start to kind of walk around and start to just daily life, our bones start to rub on each other. We start to get arthritis in the knee, start to get inflammation all around here, and it becomes very painful. What exercise does is synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid into here. All of a sudden, the cartilage laps this up, gets all the nutrients from the synovial fluid. This becomes bigger, thicker, stronger, which means that it's more likely going to um, help shock absorb. It's going to protect the bones around here and you're going to have healthier joints. And then finally, when it comes to joints, we also need to discuss increased joint stability. So joint stability is how much your joints can withstand changes in body position without getting injured. So it's really important in a variety of different sports, hockey, football, basketball, netball, rugby, volleyball and so on. If you think if your knee has loads of movement in it, you're going to damage those ligaments and the tendons around the knee. However, if they're strong if your joints are stronger and they can withstand those changes, so even though you are getting those movements, your ligaments are stronger, your connective tissues are stronger, the tendons are stronger, you're less likely going to cause an injury. 
So all need to be able to change direction quickly without twisting or dislocating any joints. That is what these supports are for. So as I've just said then, they're more stable due to the stronger tendons, ligaments and cartilage. Now you think of if that's really strong, when a, when a footballer comes in for a tackle, let's say it's quite a high tackle and it could cause some displacement of the knee joint, with stronger tendons and ligaments and cartilage, it's going to reduce the chance of that joint actually going out of position and therefore reducing the risk of injury. So, long-term benefits for muscles. What we need to talk about is muscle hypertrophy, increased number of mitochondria and improved posture. First of all, hypertrophy. As we have already learned, exercise causes micro tears in the muscle. We found that out in the responses. So we're lifting some weights and muscles get tiny, tiny little micro tears. During the recovery process, these micro tears, protein goes to the area hypertrophy occurs because the muscles become bigger and stronger so when they repair the muscles um, are able to become bigger and stronger as a result of high amounts of protein in the muscle cell this is known as hypertrophy and here's some examples down here if this person started to do weightlifting training program for six to eight weeks hopefully they'll just be looking more like this person then over a few years you get into this aren't you and that's because hypertrophy is good now hypertrophy is brilliant because it means the sports performer can generate more force a rugby forward looking like this isn't going to be any good to it, nobody easy. However, if they're looking more like this, they're going to be able to stop and do their job correctly. Also generating more force, more power within football if you're kicking the football, boxing, etc. So regular endurance training, which again is marathon running, remember. You get hypertrophy of the slow twitch muscle fibers. Slow twitch muscle fibers is what these people need. It's good for aerobic endurance sports. Regular anaerobic training without oxygen, so high speed stuff such as 100 meter sprints. If you train regularly using doing sprints, for example, you're going to get hypertrophy of the fast twitch muscle fibers, which is going to make you better at sprinting. Okay, so mitochondria. It's really important that you watch this link, okay? It's available on um, the Moodle page for you. Now, mitochondria, pardon? Are we upstairs next? Yeah, if you're just staying here, I'm just doing your screencast now. Okay. Yeah. So, mitochondria are responsible for um, aerobic energy production, i.e. for marathon runners, etc. So, due to this muscular hypertrophy that I spoke about earlier, there is room for more and larger mitochondria. So long-term endurance training can increase the size by 40%. So the size of the mitochondria actually increases by 40%. And then the number can increase by 100%, which means that we're going to be able to produce more aerobic energy um, during performance, which means we're going to be able to run for longer or cycle for longer at higher intensities. So this is going to benefit endurance runners. It would not benefit aerobic performers, though. And then finally, improved posture, long-term training, strengthen your core muscles, so your rectus abdominis, your back muscles, your, the muscles around the spine, and this helps strengthen and support your spine to provide more stable centre of gravity, which is going to help reduce the risk of falling over because your centre of gravity is, is better. So these are essential sports that um, performance and will help prevent certain injuries. Exercises to improve your posture will be plank, bridge, sit-up and crunches. Okay, so they are the long-term adaptations to the musculoskeletal system. You need to put by each one how it's going to impact and benefit the sports performer and it'll do this by reducing the risk of injury. Next screencast, we'll go through the long-term adaptations of the cardio-respiratory system. Thank you. Bye.